So, what I'd like to do now, after I uh, took you into this really quick journey into foundational knowledge, is to look a little bit more, again using the same research tools, but look a little bit more on practical problems, I guess, the problems that, um, that you're facing. And I'll start by basically translating from the new understanding um, that I hope that I demonstrated uh, in my last lecture to the challenges that we're facing now in basically translating that to daily practice, daily clinical practice. So I hope that I've convinced you now that um, one needs to look internally, inside, in order to understand what's going on in the tissues as opposed to just looking on the surface. So, uh, this is a slide that I actually changed um, in the last minute because I wanted to include this cartoon here. Um, that, that was my, like, when, when I uh, prepared these, um, this uh, trip um, and lectures, and I looked at this pressure mapping again, I thought, well, that reminds me of that Indian story. That's actually an international story now of this group of blind people trying to understand what an elephant is by just trying to fill it. And for me, to try to understand all these complex processes that I was just describing that takes on, just in the buttocks, right? Not in the entire body, because you know, people in the, in the break, during the break ask me, OK, but what happens if there are um, uh, respiratory problems or other problems? So it's just in the buttocks, even not going systemically. And you're trying to interpret that based on interface pressure. It's like this blind guy over here is trying to understand what an elephant is by just trying to sense the, the, the tail of the elephant. So we need to look internally, and there are two ways to do that. Um, to uh, use directly medical imaging, like the MRI. Um, the, for example, open MRI, but it doesn't have to be open MRI. For example, if you think about heel ulcers, you can do that using conventional MRI. I mean, the research, and we've published some work on heel ulcers, which was based on looking at the weight-bearing posterior heel using conventional MRI. You can even think about ultrasound. And probably in the future, we'll see more and more ultrasound technologies or ultrasound-based technologies being used to look at the anatomy in terms of the risk assessment process and also to look at an, an evolving tissue damage, evolving injury which happens deep because you need to have some technology to look deeper than what these will offer you. Uh, and, and the other thing is the computational modeling uh, which I've shown you in the last hour in the context of basic science, and I'm going to use that a lot in this lecture as well, but more in the context of practicalities. Now, going back into assessing cushions, I've, I've shown you that slide before, before the break, and I told you that these small differences in tissue deformation levels, in internal tissue deformation levels, can mean a lot. And they can mean a lot because this tissue tolerance curve that I've showed you before is so nonlinear that if, even if you decrease your level of deformations by just a little bit, you can buy a lot of more safe sitting time. And in order to understand, because MRI is obviously expensive, so we can't spend our entire day playing around in the MRI because um, I don't have enough research money, and I have enough research money, but not for doing that. MRI time is expensive. But here comes computational modeling to our aid. And 
the great thing about computational modeling is that you can add features into the simulation that you didn't directly observe in the MRI, but you know that they're out there. For example, I can scan a certain subject with a certain level of muscle, um, with a certain level of muscle mass, with a certain bone structure, with a certain level of fat mass, and then ask, okay, but what if? What if that same subject would, in a year from now, suffer additional muscle loss? What if, it, what if the bone, again, will continue with its, this very typical disuse-related changes to the surface, to the shape, and will change a little bit? What if, what if this person will, unfortunately, suffer a pressure ulcer in the future, and that pressure also will heal, but will leave a scar. That will again change the structure of the buttocks, at least locally. So here you'll have some kind of uh, stiff inclusion. Basically, scars are stiffer than the normal skin, uh, if it's a skin scar, uh, because when the, when the tissue heals, it heals in a non-organized manner, so you have fibers going to whatever direction, instead of this very neat arrangement that collagen in, in, in healthy, non-injured skin is having. So you can add all these features in the modeling, which is obviously much more economical than recruiting all these patients that show all these different things and put them in an MRI and scan all of them. So the ability to ask questions of what if makes these computational modeling techniques even more powerful. They not only allow you to look at all these different conditions, but also to assess risk of populations without doing these 10,000 patient studies and then relying on statistics to try to identify the factors and all the interactions that um, that we're playing in there, but rather they allow you to isolate effects, particularly if these are biomechanical effects, but a lot of it is biomechanics, so you can isolate effects. So intuitively we know that scars are not good, and when I speak to clinicians, again I'm not a clinician, but when I speak to clinicians, they tell me if a, if a patient had a pressure ulcer once, that will put him, certainly will put him in a greater risk to have another one. That's what I'm hearing all over the world. And, and, and so I decided that we should do some of these scar studies to really, since there's always the issue of, of resources, can, can be the cost of the cushion, can be the cost of, the, of, of, of care in general, again, to try and understand which scars are worse than others. And uh, so, for example, a deep tissue injury can sometimes resolve, particularly if by chance or not by chance the right things are being done and, and, and the, 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 the tissue is offloaded in time. But then again, much like in skin, these deep tissue um, scars will exist and will affect the load transfer in the tissue because they will again create a piece of tissue that is stiffer than normal. You can have obviously superficial scars, affecting also subcutaneous tissues. You can have sandwich type scars. Uh, colleagues in Japan have shown these in uh, ultrasound studies. I call them sandwich, I think the Japanese also call them sandwich scars because you have these two scars, one on the surface, one internally and in between uninjured tissue. Uh, and then there are these hourglass-shaped scars, which can be thicker or thinner. And you can look at each of these and map, basically, the risk in having each of this in terms of recurrence of pressure ulcers. And you can take all of that and look at how it behaves in interaction with the cushion. So... I'm going back now 
to the simulations that we are developing over the last two years, as Kara mentioned, uh, in collaboration with Rojo. First of all, I'm not, I'm not overestim overesting, uh, overestimating it now. It was a breakthrough in terms of the computational challenges and the computational achievements that we made in modeling this problem. So you're not engineers. I think most of you are not engineers. But you probably see the challenges of getting the physical behavior of this cushion right. So you have to represent this collapse of the cells physically. Again, it's not an animation. You have to um, represent this physical collapse of the cells with the air that they contain. You have to represent the friction that they make with the surface of the buttocks. You have to represent all these large deformation phenomena that I was mentioning earlier that take place in the tissue. And you have to do all of that together. It takes, well, they bought me a really strong computer for that. And it takes quite sophisticated software. Um, and, and even then, each of these simulations will, can take uh, um, hours to calculate, to solve. But once you have it, you have the dynamics of what's going on when the body is immersing in the, in the, in the cushion. And one of the things that immediately emerged was that um, this cushion is doing a wonderful job in envelopment. It covers almost the entire surface of the buttocks. Another thing that emerged is that when you compare that to just standard form as kind of a baseline, as kind of a reference cushion to which you would, uh, to which you would start, um, 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 uh, to which you would um, try to compare other more sophisticated cushions, you see that this envelopment just doesn't happen. So even with cushions that have realistic stiffnesses, but they're just simple forms, the, count, the kind that you have on your couch at home or something like that, even medical forms, they don't achieve the same level of envelopment. Now, the next thing that emerged was that this level of envelopment correlates very strongly with the internal tissue loads. And not only that it correlates very strongly, it's correlated, it's, it's correlated in a very nonlinear, what we call manner. So by adding just a little bit more of envelopment, you can reduce these internal tissue loads here at the bone muscle interface by a lot. And if you look at the scale here, this is the scale of internal tissue loading. We call it stress, which is basically the engineering term of the force that is transferred through the tissue per unit of area of tissue, kind of a normalized uh, measure of a force, an internal force. You see that the scale here is in kilopascals. Pascal is the uh, unit where you measure stresses. Kilopascals mean thousands of. Where here, it's less than one Pascal. So orders of magnitude away, actually 10,000 times um, difference. So even though you see, as you would expect, uh, these red colors here at the bone muscle interface, these red colors here are, again, 10,000 times, basically, lower than what you get here. By the way, on the surface, these orders of magnitude differences do not 
show, do not manifest. You have to look internally. Again, think of that pencil that is pressing against this form and this localized loading that you see here. So our first conclusion from looking at these simulations was that the level of envelopment, if you increase the level of envelopment, you can hugely decrease the level of internal tissue loads, particularly at the bone muscle interface. More envelopment, less internal loading. You can actually calculate, we, again, engineers like to use numbers, you can calculate envelopment in these simulations, so how much of the skin area is actually in contact with the cushion as the body is immersing into the cushion, and you can compare that level of envelopment, which here was normalized uh, to a value which ranges between zero and one, so it's almost one, you see, you can correlate that to the level of internal tissue loading. So if you compare form cushions with different stiffnesses to um, a Rojo type cushion, you see the, the huge differences in, 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 envelop, uh, in envelopment levels including in cases where you have these pathoanatomies that I was describing in the last lecture, this uh, bone adaptation, this muscle atrophy, a combination of those, a combination of those, of those during a spastic event, so S stands for spasms. That's also very relevant if you have a spinal cord injury. Even if you change the stiffness of the foam cushion, it doesn't, we, it, it does affect the envelopment level by just a little bit. It doesn't change it a lot. But with all these events, with all these pathoanatomical and pathophysiological changes going on, you still have a very high level, again, above 0 0.9, where the maximum is 1, for a Rojo type cushion. And when you plot the internal stress levels of these different cushions, it's not surprising, but based on what I've just said, that again, 10,000 times difference between stress levels uh, in the um, air cell based cushions and the form cushions, with the, with the, with the form cushions provide much higher values. But what also, what also was interesting, on top of that, is that when you describe, in the computer simulations, when you describe all these pathoanatomical, pathophysiological changes that take place in the body, what you see, for example, when you look at fat tissue, what you see is that these pathoanatomical changes that will affect most of the spinal cord injury population will tend to increase the uh, deep tissue loading. That's not surprising. We've seen that before. I've explained that before. I explained why that happens, and we've looked at all these MRI images from the spinal cord injury patients. So that's not surprising. But when you use a, an air cell based cushion, it looks like the level of envelopment, which is reducing these internal tissue loads, is also able to neutralize, kind of neutralize, the effect of the pathoanatomical changes. So these are certainly not increasing the level of loads. I, I wouldn't want to say that they decrease, because um, uh, sometimes a combination of them tend to increase them but just a little bit, but there's certainly no trend of increasing the uh, load levels uh, in, when compared to this reference, the R configuration, the reference configurations where the pathoanatomical changes are not present. Same phenomena with skin. That's not necessarily skin surface, that's what happened internally in the skin so along the skin th thickness, 
which brings me back to this curve again. Now showing that basically the level of envelopment, where it's high and where it's reducing this internal tissue loads, which puts you here, say, it would buy you more safe sitting time than if you're here, low level of envelopment, high tissue loads, then you're here, short, safe sitting time. I've explained why that happens in my, in my uh, morning's uh, lecture. And now, as I've said, you can ask all of these what if questions. So wh uh, what if there was a scar there? What if that scar was really big? So one of these hourglass scars that I've shown you before. This hourglass type two means that's a big hourglass scar. It's a scar, it's stiff, it's go, it goes all the way from the skin to the bone, and it concentrates loads in it and around it. Actually, if you have such a big scar, that's not good, and you can see it, you can actually see it here. It visualizes why it's not good. If you have a sandwich type scar, which is basically a scar that does not penetrate uh, the, um, through all the layers of the tissues, you see the effects, you see the local effects here, compare that to here, they're, they're not present here, but they are present here. But it's not that bad. Where you have just a thin scar on your skin, it nearly doesn't affect what happens internally. It can affect, obviously, what happens on your skin. But it nearly doesn't affect what happens internally. So you can look at all these different cases and evaluate the individual cases which represent an individual or a group of individuals uh, with a similar condition and use that, A, for risk assessment and B, for asking whether that cushion would function and would function as equally, as equally well if there is some additional change in the structure, in the anatomy, that would affect the weight bearing, with scars being an excellent example because they're so common. So basically, you can take all of these cases where you have scars and basically divide the level of loading in a certain tissue, say in the muscle tissue, that you find when there is a scar there by the level of loading when there's no scar and get an index. We like dimensionless indexes because um, it, it allows you to compare things that are not easy to compare, like different types of scars. So obviously when you take a condition when there's no scar and uh, you divide it by a condition where there's no scar, you should get one, right, unity. So this is why the unity line is here. And we really look for the cases where these bars cross the unity line, which means that the scar puts you, the presence of the scar puts you at a greater risk for reoccurrence, for an additional injury. And as I've mentioned, it typically happens with the big scars. You don't want to have any big scars. That's not good. If you have them, it's difficult to protect the tissues, even with a Rojo cushion. Uh, and that, that's uh, something uh, that uh, repeats uh, when you look at different tissues, so in fat, for example. When you look at skin, just, at, just, as, as, uh, just at skin, uh, then even a thin scar which just affects the skin will affect the loading levels in skin. Because if you have a thin scar in your skin, then uh, that basically weakens the skin and stretches the skin around it, uh, which is why you have these um, additional loads 
So I, in general, I would say that scores are not good. Um, but if you look at the effects of um, scars on internal loading on a Rojo cushion and compare that to the um, effects of scars on standard foams, again, there is a huge difference. So you've seen the, that even these worst cases, these hourglass scars, cause like below 50% increase in the um, level of internal loading in on a foam cushion it can be more than twice as much so instead of 50% it could be even like three times as much so what i'm saying is that the level of envelopment and the increase in the surface area for load transfer that this level of envelopment provides is not only protecting you from a pressure ulcer, it also protects you potentially from reoccurrence of pressure ulcers, assuming that your, pressure, that your previous pressure ulcer was small enough and didn't leave a huge scar. So, I hope that at this point, I managed to convince you that envelopment is important because it reduces the internal, not, this, not necessarily the skin, the internal tissue loading levels. So if that was a, a very stiff surface, say a wooden chair, wouldn't create any envelopment, or would create very little envelopment, just in the contact uh, between the buttocks and the and the, and the surface, your internal loading levels would be here, which is why you would get a pressure ulcer on it very soon. And as you increase the level of envelopment, you buy yourself much more safe sitting time, and even a small increase can manifest a small, you see this? Even a small decrease in the levels of tissue loading can buy you much more safe sitting time due to the non-linearity of the curve. Sorry, I have to use engineering terms here. Okay, so high envelopment is good, but there are different technologies to provide that, right? It's not only SL based, it's not only Rojo. You can do it by other approaches, one of which would be to fit you with the, with the perfect shape of your body. So get a contoured form cushion, in simple words. Get a cushion that perfectly fits the contours of your body that will envelope you perfectly, and that should work. So this is, why we this is what we wanted to do, to see if these are the same things. That's a very interesting question. I've just been a month ago um, at the International Seating Symposium uh, in Vancouver. Um, and I was, um, that was my first time in the International Seating Symposium. I was walking through the exhibition. I was amazed. So many different solutions, so many different cushion technologies. For me, as an engineer with some experience, it says that you probably don't understand the problem at all if you have so many solutions to the same problem. So I wanted to take like two, because standard like flat forms, you wouldn't really use them on a high risk patient. I, want to take, I wanted to take two different approaches and to compare this, maybe not directly, but to see what would be the performances of these two different approaches um, using the same tool, which is computer simulations. Um, so I'm reminding you again of these um, issues of the pathoanatomical changes and the pathophysiological changes that happen in, again, the population that we are very interested in, which is spinal cord injury patients. And I've, I've, I've listed them here again. 
we've talked about probably all of them besides this one. There's also disuse response in the skin. There's a disuse response in any tissue of our body. Once we lie in bed uh, for prolonged times, uh, well, the, the classical example would be astronauts, right, that go um, to, uh, to the space station and then go back, and then you have to put them in wheelchairs immediately, right? Why is that? Because their bones are so fragile. The muscle mass has been reduced so much. The same thing happens in bed or in a chair. If you chronically sit or chronically lie down, again, going back to what I've mentioned about maintaining the muscle masses of your patients, the same thing would happen in a chair or a bed. And I've adopted this curve, which I liked very much from a paper published by someone else, not by me, uh, in spinal cord uh, a couple of years ago, that shows you how fast you lose muscle mass and how fast you lose bone mass after a spinal cord injury. Within weeks, it's gone. And you see all these changes that I've shown you in the MRI scans. So if you start from a structure like this, within weeks, you'll have something which is more similar to this, and within a year or so, you end up with a completely different anatomy, and I've shown you that before. Now I've just basically summarized this in a, in a scheme, right? But all of these changes, these changes to the bone contours, these changes to the muscle contents, the fat infiltration, these are the white stripes that you see here, changes to the muscle mass, more fat tissue, as muscle is being replaced by fat, but also as the patient is, as happens many times, gaining weight. So within months to years, you would typically end up with a different anatomy, either internally or externally, or both. Typically both. So if you had a cushion that was perfect, perfectly fitting, after just a couple of months, it wouldn't fit anymore. Now, I've been told that in the United States, the reimbursement policy is changing now, and they move uh, from allowing a patient to change their cushions once in three years, in three years' time, they move uh, to once in every five years. If you think about that, even three years is a huge amount of time. Because what they tend to forget, that it's not only the cushion which, which is changing, of course it wears out and it changes its properties and its structure, it's also the patient's body which is constantly changing, particularly in this population. So we've decided that we'll try to simulate that and see what happens. And I like the simulations very much. They are quite new. We didn't even publish them yet in a journal paper. Um, and what they show is basically what I told you. Assuming that you fit a contoured form cushion to an individual close to the event of the injury, I don't know to say how much close. Could be weeks, I don't know. Right? And it fits very nicely. It's all blue inside. Blue is good. Very low levels of stress. I would say comparable to the Rojo cushion. After the spinal cord injury, patient would typically experience what we call a catabolic response in their tissue. It's kind of a shock response. Um, sometimes manifested by loss of weight. There is some loss of weight, so the, the cushion is not fitting anymore. All this very nice confinement where your body was so well enveloped is gone now. There is these gaps now because the patient had lost some weight, which allows the tissue to expand laterally. And that will bring you closer to a condition as if you had like one of these flat foam cushions that don't produce much of envelopment, but allow this lateral expansion. This lateral expansion means that internally you'll have 
large deformations. So compare this color to this color. It's all on the same scale. And that's because there is shear, because the, uh, the um, tissues are allowed now to move laterally. So there is shear right under the bone. There is tension, tension because the tissues are um, elongating, basically. They're stretching under the bone as they bear the body weight. So you end up with greater level of stress, not by, not, not by a huge amount, but it's there. A much worse case comes on later in the life of the patient when he starts gaining weight, which is typically what, ha what happens, say, within a year or so. And then look at what happens. So again, the, the cushion doesn't fit from the other side of the, of the scale, right? So now it's too small for a too, bigger, for a too big buttocks. You say buttocks in England? We've discussed this before, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now, what you have, look at this kind of step in the cushion. What it does basically is that it pushes on the skin and uh, basically constraining it. It's like taking a nail, not as sharp as a nail, but taking a nail and like holding it in that spot. But the tissues need to go somewhere, right, because of this body weight that needs to go somewhere. So they deform here. There's no constraint here. So you have this huge shear between your fat which is free to slide over the muscle here and the muscle, right? So it's constrained here, sliding here, huge levels of shear compared to here. Here there's nothing, right? Now if you combine that with these pathoanatomical changes that I've mentioned, particularly with this fat infiltration, with this atrophy of muscle, which is accompanied by, it, by the invasion of fat tissue into muscle tissue. You can see that very well here. This is another MRI scan of a spinal cord injury that we have scanned. Then you not only have this huge shear at the bone, uh, sorry, at the fat muscle interface, you also have it internally in the muscle as these muscle segments slide against each other and in between, there's just soft fat uh, that can't prevent it, really can't resist it. So this is all adding together and creating this huge effect of internal tissue shearing um, in the, I would say, mid to long term of using the cushion. So envelopment is really not enough. You need something in the cushion which will respond to these changes that take place in the patient's body. Because the patient's body is also a dynamic system. It changes. It doesn't stay the same like the cushion. Even the cushion changes. So again, as engineers, we like to quantify things. So we've just plotted these, what we call histograms, basically showing the domains, the ranges of exposure to stress in each of these conditions as the body gains body weight and, and fat mass, and also initially where there's this catabolic response. And basically you see that as you move chronologically between the conditions, so you start here, right after injury, then the body loses some weight, then it starts to gain weight. You basically shift the stress levels internally in the tissue, particularly in fat, you shift them to the high levels. If you look at strain levels, so strains again are relative deformations, relative deformation levels, and particularly at shear strains, which is what I've shown you in these animations, 
you see that you start with strain levels that are OK for both fat and muscle tissue. We know that from a tissue engineering work. 0 0.5 uh, or 50 percent, that's the same thing, is tolerable. But very quickly, as the body changes, it shifts to levels that are clearly, we know that based on our tissue engineering, engineering experimental work, are not tolerable. So basically, I don't know, I don't know if, if it's after a couple of months or after a couple of years. It depends on the individual and the lifestyle and many, many, and the nutrition and many, many other things. But basically, one slides, one doesn't even know about it, but one slides from the protected zone to a zone where he's exposed daily to a risk of a deep tissue injury. Um, and there is one other factor that needs to be taken into account uh, in this very complex equation, which is how the individual is using the cushion. And I'll just give you one example for that. That is also a joint project that we have done with, together with Rojo that doesn't even connect to the Rojo cushion directly, but I think that it added uh, fundamental knowledge to the field on how the intrinsic characteristics of using the cushion are affecting the internal tissue loads uh, when uh, the body is being supported. So we focused on these um, push-ups, these pressure relief maneuvers uh, that um, subjects, uh, that individuals who are able to do should do. And now putting for a second my other hat uh, of uh, the European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, we publish guidelines. And in these guidelines, we said, we say what I just said, that one needs to change posture and to relieve tissue loads. It says pressure, but I prefer the term tissue loads after everything that I've told you. And one needs to do that, say, every 30 minutes or every 20 minutes. But it never says, not even in our guidelines, to which I'm responsible, it never says how to do it. It just says that you need to do it. Now, since, as I've shown you, you can basically capture all the dynamics, all the time course of this internal tissue loading when you do this computer simulation, it was interesting to see what is the rate of loading in the different tissues. How does, for example, the rate of loading in skin compares to that in fat? What you see is that while when someone is sitting down after a push-up maneuver, there is a rapid rise in the loading level of skin, particularly shear, right? Because the skin is kind of sliding against the surface. You've seen that in the simulations. And it, it, it happens fast for the first phase, for, for, for the initial contact between the body and the cushion. And then it kind of slows down. In fat tissue, the rate is much more constant. I would say even constant. So if I'm thinking about a patient that can lift himself, and then at the moment when he's um, above the cushion, he can do two things. He can sit down now back on the cushion and he can do it slowly, or he can basically drop himself into the cushion. Now biomechanically, if you look at these curves, the skin, because of the higher loading rate here, is at risk of injury, basically tearing, as the surface of the body meets the surface of the cushion. And it doesn't say anywhere that you need to do it slowly and gradually. Maybe you understand it intuitively. I'm not sure that all the patients understand it. But here is a piece of evidence 
why you should also think about how the patient behaves with the cushion and not just about the structures, either the structures of the tissues or the structures of the structure of the cushion. It's also about what you do with the cushion. And there are also other factors that uh, play a role in this. So for example, this phenomena that I've just described, if you sit faster, if you fall to the chair, and the stiffness of the cushion, that again doesn't refer to raw products or air cell based products in general, it refers to just simple flat form cushions, but the phenomena is important. If you sit down and you basically are falling onto the cushion and the cushion is stiff, then it's even worse. If the cushion is softer, then it can maybe absorb some of this. But the bottom line of it is don't fall into the cushion. Load your skin and your other tissues as well, mildly and slowly. If you think about the disuse related changes in the tissues, particularly in the skin, which makes them more fragile, makes them more vulnerable, that's even more important to not load these tissues rapidly. If you have a scar, then that becomes even more important. And if you have specific, type of, uh, specific types of scars, for example, in these types of simulations, hypertrophic scars, so the kind of these scars which um, basically are big scars, uh, they have this uh, curvature and they're stiff. If you have these types of scars, your what we call stress dose, which basically the, is the loading dose uh, that these tissues would suffer, uh, will be the highest. And then that also implies that, first of all, surgically, when you correct the pressure ulcer, you don't want to leave that scar because that scar will put that patient at risk until the end of his life. So you want to have something smooth. Well, you, you don't have much control on the softness, but at least the surface, the closure, the surgical techniques need to be taken into account. And then also the, patient, the patient's behavior. So I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Or I'm starting to wrap up now. Um, we, know, we all know, and it's in every guidelines that you will pick up from anywhere around the world, that it's, it's important to use a cushion. It's important to use a cushion that doesn't bottom out. So it's important. Actually, in some guidelines, it says it's important to use an appropriate cushion. What's appropriate? Well, kill me, I don't know. Especially, again, going back to that exhibition in Vancouver, it's very confusing. And I guess from your perspective, it's even more confusing. So we need evidence. And we need basic research. And that's where bioengineers can play a role, because in other areas of medicine, bioengineering has actually revolutionized uh, technologies and, and, and treatments. If you think about cardiovascular, uh, the cardiovascular arena, the orthopedic arena, you know, stents, joint implants, that's all bioengineering. What do we do for wounds? Not much, because of many, many reasons. I can give a whole like, seminar on that. But the bottom line is that things are changing now which is good, that was very evident in Southampton in our focused meeting. And things begin to uh, be more and more supported by science, by basic science, kind of the work that we do, and also by clinical evidence-based research. And when these two combine together and they point to the same outcomes, that's good. That's the way that other fields of medicine are uh, making progress. Um, I've shown you why interfa interface pressure measurements are just not enough and you need to look internally. I showed you that uh, there are imaging techniques that are able to do that now. And there are other imaging techniques actually that I, that I didn't mention. For example, example tagging MRI. That's an imaging technique, you can read about it, you can Google about it, that allows you, even without finite element modeling, to look at local levels of tissue deformations. Basically, it does the finite element um, process 
on the image. So it divides the MRI image into these little elements and does these calculations. So you can say it's, uh, it's, it's similar, it is similar, but the bottom line of it is that um, if you combine standard imaging with more advanced computer-based techniques to look at the localized loading levels internally, then you've done something very important for understanding why pressure also happened. Actually, pressure ulcers, I'm starting to think, is not a perfect word for it. It's basically deformation injuries. That's what they are. I've showed you the importance of envelopment. And I've showed you that by increasing envelopment, you can reduce tissue loading levels by, say, 10,000 times. But that envelopment needs to be smart. It needs to respond to how the body behaves and how the body changes over life, short term and long term. And I've used, in a paper that I've just published recently, just months ago, in ostomy wound management, I've used the term adjustability. And adjustability can mean different things, but they all connect. It can mean that the cushion fits what the patient needs and wants to do. So for example, to support his posture, so he's stable on the wheelchair, but also to allow him to reach so that he's able to do whatever he wants to do and whatever he likes to do. But on the same time, not only provide the envelopment, which is so important, but then adapt this level of envelopment to the changes that take place inside that patient, internally in the anatomy and the physiology. And then the last component that I referred to in that complex equation was the patient's own behavior, how the patient interacts basically with the cushion and with the wheelchair. It's not only the cushion, it's also the wheelchair, but that's a topic for a different lecture. And, and, and there are intrinsic factors and intrinsic risk factors. So again, pressure relief behavior, inclusions in tissues like scars. And if I would need to summarize everything that I've delivered in these, ne in these two sessions, in just one slide, well, I came up with this equation. That's not really an equation, but it's something that you can remember, right? Like the theory of relativity, which is everyone remembers the, that equation, right? So um, it's an equation that you, can, um, that you can take home, like as a take home message. Um, this is very important, envelopment. This is very important, and that adjustability, they need to go together. And if you have both of them, that will certainly provide with what we know now, at this moment, safer sitting. Perhaps somewhere in the future we'll have these magic methods to correct pressure ulcers or to avoid them completely. But what you can do like tomorrow morning or tonight is to employ this equation.